And we thank God that he is always dependable and always the one that we could rely on completely uh, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. And so that's why we come together to worship. So let's go ahead and bow together in prayer. Father, thank you that we could lean upon your everlasting arms and that you are the God who is the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is the beginning and the last, the one who oversees not only the creation of the universe, but that you also promise that you will make all things new. And at the end of history, that we will see your power and your glory and your grace like never before. And so, Father, I pray that as we get ready for what heaven's going to be like worshiping you in your presence, that you would draw us closer into your presence and that we would have, even this morning, a greater sense of anticipation of what it means to bow before your very presence as we stand up for you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A few days ago, we brought Valentine's cards to the residents at Sunrise Senior Living. And these cards lit up the room. I mean, these cards were created and designed by our very own kids here at Bread of Life Church. And I appreciate Darren and Eileen and leading their class to, to design these expressions of love for the residents at Sunrise. And you could see there's Pikachu, there's Pokemon Go, there's, you know, just different symbols. I don't know if Valentine's, but at least expressions of art from our kids. Some of them even included Bible verses, like they had Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14 was another passage where it talks about the qualities that God wants us to put on, like compassion and forbearance and forgiveness, and above all these things, to put on love, as it were, like the bow on top of the box. Because love binds all these things together in perfect harmony. And so as we talked with the residents about these cards, and, and they, their faces just beamed with gratitude with even a sense of wonder over the creativity of our youngest students. And that naturally gave us the opportunity to talk about what it means to love one another, what it means to experience love in our relationships with those that God has placed in our own circles, our family and our friends, our neighbors and our colleagues, our classmates. And sometimes even the challenges that we have that loving people is not always easy. And there are times when we have to deliberately put on love because it's hard. Or there are moments in which we think our love is so limited and we think of the love of God that God demonstrates toward us in that while we're yet sinners, a love that's unconditional and that's matchless. And as we talk about the way that we love each other, we naturally landed upon God's supreme love for us that there is no greater love in all of the world, in all of our experience, than the love that God has for you and me through his one and only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we enter into this love if we receive Jesus as our personal Savior, that we believe he died once for our sins so that we could live forever with his righteousness. And so the story of God's love becomes a part of our own personal story as we place our faith in Jesus as our personal Savior. And I don't know where you are today, but it's possible that, that we've gone to church or we've tapped into live streams and we've had conversations with people of faith and we have a little bit of an idea of what the Christian faith is all about and maybe even ideas related to the gospel, but it's very possible that you have never come to that actual place of trusting in Jesus as your personal savior. And so the greatest expression of love in human history, of God sending Jesus to die upon the cross for us, becomes a part of your story and mine the moment we place our faith in him as our personal savior. And just as our youngest kids have proclaimed the gospel of God 
through these beautifully designed and created Valentine's Day greetings for the residents at sunrise. We're privileged to testify of the crucified, the risen, and the ascended Messiah. And part of our testimony is that we could stand tall and we could speak boldly without shame, without apology, without hesitation, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one comes to the Father except through him. And that's where things get a little dicey because we live in a world that doesn't want to have conversations like that. We live in a pluralistic culture that embraces multiple routes to heaven and the afterlife. That champions tolerance and inclusion. And so if we say that there's no other name except the name of Jesus by which we could be brought back into a right relationship with God, then you're going to get pushed back. We're going to face ridicule and resistance. There's going to be people that actually call us names, like things like we're bigoted, or we're narrow-minded, or we're so backward or obtuse in our thinking that we're out of touch with modern society. They might even say something like we're unloving. And so if we were to talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ in the way that we understand it, that there is no other way to the Father except through the Son, and that there is no name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. People are not going to give us the time of day. And there's going to be this pushback and this resistance and this hostility. A rise in the temperature that might tempt us to back down to scale back, to soften our position, to somehow modify our stance. And so how do we hold fast? How do we hang on to the core truth when we feel the pressure to let go? What does it take for us to step up as faithful witnesses when others urge us? To back down. I mean, it might your it, it could be your classmates. I mean, you are so fired up after our high school winter retreat that you can't wait to share the gospel with your friends until you see the look on their faces and the looks of of disbelief that you would say that there is no other name under heaven given among students by which we must be saved. We might be so fired up after a, a weekend with brothers and sisters in Christ and, and being around the word of God that we can't wait to, to be with our family members or maybe our neighbors who are not yet following Jesus and we are all in until we feel the pushback and the resistance and the change of temperature. We will courageously speak about Jesus as long as we consistently listen to God. Because when the Holy Spirit fills my heart, when the Holy Spirit takes hold of your soul, then we will become less fearful and more humble. When the Holy Spirit is the one that's controlling us and moving us and shaping our words and settling our hearts so that we could think clearly and speak boldly, then we will become less fearful and more humble as we point others to Christ. Leaning in closer to God enables us to stand up taller for Jesus. And that's what we're going to see this morning. That leaning in closer to God enables us to stand up taller for Jesus. And that's because lifting up our voices to God will always embolden our witness for him. Especially when others try to silence or cancel us out. The title for today's message is Digging In. 
Because those are the two words that came on my mind as I looked at Acts chapter 4, because that's exactly what the disciples are doing. They're digging in. In a literal sense, military troops dig in to establish a secure defensive position. And so as a civilian, if we say that we're going to dig in, that we are holding fast even though the tide may rise against us, that we're going to stick with our convictions even when they become unpopular, even when people give us a look of disbelief and consternation and, and absolute bewilderment, that we're going to hold fast and stay with the truth of the gospel. In fact, if you were to look up digging in, there's an amplification of this idea to literally dig in one's heels. And it speaks of taking or persisting in an uncompromising position or attitude despite opposition. That we're going to persist in an unwavering, unflinching, unashamed position, despite the winds blowing right in our faces. And that's the posture we see in the followers of Christ as they bear witness to the reality of his resurrection. And so as we've been looking at the book of Acts and Luke's sequel to the person of Christ, not only what he began to do, but what he continued to do and to teach through his spiritually empowered disciples, We've seen astronomical growth. I mean, (laughs) Peter is on fire for the kingdom of God. And as he preaches, obviously by the power of God's spirit, thousands and thousands and thousands of people are coming to faith in Christ. But Luke's also going to tell us about some real growing pains. Pains that come from those who are openly hostile from the outside. But also with some issues that are happening within the church. And what we're going to learn is a question that I've framed for us to consider is, how does praying together strengthen our hearts to keep telling others about Jesus, even when we feel resistance. That is, how do we dig in our heels? How do we stay firm in the faith? How do we remain faithful to the gospel, even when we feel the winds blowing against us? And we're going to see how the disciples, they, they, they pray together. And how praying together has a way of building up their courage in one another to be faithful to Jesus. And so I want to thank Auntie Faith and for all those who are helping our youngest kids to go bold and to go strong for Jesus. And so this morning, we're privileged to look at Acts chapter 4, a closer look at the first 31 verses of this chapter, which really provide an extension of what just transpired in the preceding chapter with this miraculous healing of a middle-aged man who was lame from his mother's womb. And with God at work, they're leaping together in wholehearted worship and praise. And while all the people are struck with amazement over this indisputable manifestation of God's supreme power, not everyone is jumping for praise. Because there are some that are actually cracking down on the apostolic witness in fear. And so in verses 1 to 22, we're going to see how the disciples encounter resistance from stubborn individuals. And these are guys that should have known better. They were trained in the Old Testament. They knew, they were the the God experts of their culture. But the disciples encounter resistance from these stubborn individuals who reject the name of Jesus. And then in verses 23 to 31, we're going to see how the disciples exhibit resilience with like-minded witnesses who trust the sovereignty of God. You see, up to this point in the story of the early church, everything is going well. I mean, things couldn't go better. It's as if all the winds are behind them. 
The Spirit comes, miracles happen. A spiritually empowered Peter speaks for the rest to clearly explain to these huge crowds that what everyone sees and hears is God at work. Peter eloquently, powerfully, emphatically, dramatically connects the current events that the people are seeing to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and the promises of God all the way back to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And that's what we see in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Acts. And as we turn to chapter 4, we catch the first inkling that not everyone feels good about their explosive growth and their expanding influence. And so let's hear how the disciples encounter resistance from stubborn individuals who reject the name of Jesus. Beginning at verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple, the second in command, and the Sadducees came upon them. And they were greatly annoyed. We would think, man, the priest, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees, they were seeing what's happening. They saw this miracle upon miracles. This man who had never taken a step in his life for 40 plus years. You would imagine that just as Peter and John and this man who was healed, that they're jumping for joy in the temple of God, that the religious leaders would be jumping just as high with them. But Luke tells us they're totally ticked off. They're completely agitated, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people, that is Peter and John, and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But in contrast to the religious leaders who are like the party poopers, the guys who just can't recognize that God's at work, Luke says, but... Many of those who heard the word believed. They heard Peter's message about this man being healed in the name of Christ and by the power of the resurrection of the exalted king. And the number of men came to about 5,000. And we don't know if it's a total of 5,000 or it's another 5,000 on top of the 3,000 that had already placed their faith in Jesus Christ. A man lame from birth gets Peter and John from them more than they could ever imagine. Rather than getting gold or silver or a few coins, this guy literally receives the miracle of a lifetime. He gets his legs back, his feet and his ankles are strengthened. He stands up, he walks, he jumps in worship. But more than a miracle of a lifetime, he gets the Messiah for an eternity. And this man's life, the word is healing, and it's not simply a physical healing, but it's a restoration of his soul to God. And there's good reason why they're in worship. There's a deep drive within their hearts that have propelled them into the temple to give glory to God. And as the crowd is just wondering how this has taken place, And as they recognize this man as the one who had been lamed from birth and begging in front of the temple, now he's inside the temple, no longer outside the gate, but in the temple, no longer on his bottom, but on his feet. No longer just wanting a handout, but giving God glory. Peter looks out at the crowd and says, you know, I just want you to know that the one whom you crucified God raised to life. And the fact that we could raise this man who was born lame up physically is based upon the one whom God raised back to life after his death upon the cross. Nothing more, nothing less. And it's the name of Jesus that is the difference in this man's life. And Luke tells us that the religious leaders, the chief priest, and the the temple guard, and those who were overseeing the religious affairs, the Sadducees, and this is like the spiritual bigwigs. It's as if this is the Supreme Court 
of the temple. They were overseeing all things related to the worship of God. And Luke tells us that they are greatly annoyed and deeply bothered, agitated in their hearts by the fact that they are proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And so, you know, the Jews generally believed in a future resurrection of the dead at the end of human history. But then it was a totally different thing for them to preach that Jesus rose from the dead alone as a vindication of his death for us, as a confirmation of his unique relationship with God as his glorified servant, as a harbinger or a glimpse of our future resurrection as we connect ourselves in faith to Jesus. And the Sadducees themselves, they didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead, and that's why they say they were sad, you see, because they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And so even when Peter and John are preaching the resurrection from the dead, it's dividing the family of religious leaders between the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the chief priest. It's as if he's throwing gasoline on a theological debate between the religious leaders. And when Luke says that the religious leaders come upon Peter and John, it's kind of like someone standing in your face. It's like someone who points their finger down at you. There's a sense of condescension. There is a feeling of, of utter shock for being disrespected and dishonored. It's a confrontational stance. And yet, Luke says thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people are trusting the witness of the apostles that Jesus is alive from the dead. And by the power of God's Spirit, hearts are repenting and turning back to faith in God, recognizing the inadequacy of their own self-righteousness and that Jesus died for their sins once so that they might live forever with his righteousness. And a totally recharged and restored and reinvigorated Peter leads the way for the continued expansion of God's work. And then take a look at verse 5. These dignified powers that be, the religious hotshots, they go back to their usual tactics. Verse 5, on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together. They, they huddled together in Jerusalem with Hannas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, the son of law, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. I mean, this is a noble gathering. And when they had set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Imagine in our mind's eye, this gathering of rulers and elders and scribes and high priests seated together in a semicircle. And as they're seated together in a semicircle, not like a you know, straight line like the Supreme Court, but a semicircle, they could see one another. Then they put Peter and John and this man who was once lame, now healed, right there in their midst. Talk about a place of intimidation. A place of interrogation, of examination. And they simply say to them, by what power or name did you do this? In other words, they can't even get themselves to say the man who was once lame from birth is now healed. How did that happen? No, they refer to that dramatic, decisive miracle as this. And they're saying, wait, what, what kind of magic did you use? What kind of authority did you invoke? Who gives you the right to do what you did 
and to say what you're saying. You see, the temple is the home court of the scribes and the high priest, the elders. This is their place. And Peter and John are standing there with this man who is obviously lame from birth, now healed, and staring them right in the face, this miracle from God, God at work. And Peter is just preaching the word of God, the name of Christ, and how God raised up the one they crucified according to his perfect plan. And it's by the authority of this one whom God raised that we raise this man up. And the leaders are seated in this imposing, intimidating semicircle, looking down at Peter and John and this man who was healed and says, tell us, how did you do this? And they are filled with fury. They are just saturated with disgust. And then Peter, verse 8, I love this, his God-informed, spirit-emboldened, Christ-centered, hard-hitting, Truth reply. Then Peter, it's as if the cue came, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, and we saw that in chapter 2 and chapter 3, there's no wiggling out of their responsibility. Whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And then verse 12. And there is salvation, there's healing, there's redemption, there's justification in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And Peter is essentially giving a repeat of what he just declared in chapter 3. It's not me. It's not our power. It's not our piety. But it's by the pure authority and the power and the name of Jesus Christ that this man stands before you healed. And he wants everyone to know it. He wants all the people of Israel to know that the God who has promised to bless us and to use us as a source of blessing to all the families of the earth, that this God has come through in the person of his one and only son to bring about this man's radical transformation from a lame beggar outside the gate to a leaping worshiper inside the temple. And this miracle happened by the name of Jesus Christ, of Nazareth. And it's as if Peter goes a little bit deeper. He says, hey, you know, now that I'm talking about the name of Jesus, the one that you crucified and rejected, the one that God raised up and chose to be his cornerstone, the foundation upon which he would build his church, I just want you to know that salvation is found in nowhere else. That it's exclusively and entirely in the name of Jesus that this man is healed and that we are saved. Being seated above the defendants in this half circle, I could imagine this highly respected assembly of leaders looking at Peter cross-eyed and, you know, faces getting all crinkled up and disgust and disbelief and, and looking at one another and thinking, what do we do with this guy? And they're absolutely dumbfounded with the eloquence and the composure and the directness of Peter's witness. Take a look at verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, 
Now, when they saw the boldness, and the word there for boldness is freedom of speech. It's shameless conversation. This ability to speak the truth from our hearts without hesitation, without halting. Fearless confidence. When they saw the fearless confidence of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they didn't go to the rabbinical schools. They're not theologically schooled. They're just professional fishermen. I mean, they made a good living, living in the Mediterranean. They were, I don't know what they were fishing, but they were, they were successful in their craft. But they were not theologically educated. They never went to seminary school. They never took a preaching class. They never studied hermeneutics. They never studied church history. And, and the religious leaders who were schooled in all things God, they're looking at Peter and they're thinking, how did that guy there have the ability to speak in such a powerful fashion to those of us up here? And Luke says they were astonished. They were put in their place. They were silenced. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. They didn't study under a Gamaliel type. They didn't go to rabbi theological seminary. But there was something about the texture of their character, the style of their communication, the manner of their presence that showed us that they had been with Jesus. And that tells me when others are quick to dismiss us, when people are maybe wanting to cancel what you want to proclaim, that through Peter and John, we see that we will stand firmly with Jesus when we walk intimately with him. And that's why Peter and John, they didn't waver. They didn't back down. They didn't cower in fear. But because they walked intimately with Jesus, they stood firmly with him. Whatever people might say about you, whatever people might conclude about my life, they may not have the biblical language that we would use. But I would hope that they would say something that gets into the neighborhood of, I don't know, there's something about who they are and how their heart works and the way that they speak and the calmness of their soul and the conviction of their hearts that, that they have a real relationship with Jesus. And they may not be sophisticated in their analysis of how they parse and analyze your life, but they think, man, when I see your life and when I am with you, there's something about you that's solid, that's authentic, that's infectious. And they say it's because you are with Jesus. The leaders have two big issues. The first is this guy who was lame from birth standing. <laughs> How did that happen? And the problem is that it's an undeniable miracle. The second big problem is that everyone's believing in the word of Peter and John. People are believing that God raised Jesus from the dead. People are believing that there is no other name under heaven given among us by which we must be saved. And the religious leaders, like they did in the time of Jesus just days earlier, when they saw this, the tide of popularity swing away from them toward the disciples, that became their problem. 
because they were losing followers. And these unauthorized teachers in their mind are respected by all. Since, Since the leaders are stumped, they huddle together for a game plan. A new game plan. Take a look at verse 15. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, that is Peter and John and this man who was once lame, they conferred with one another in this half-circle gathering of distinguished religious leaders. And they said, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign had been performed through them is evident. I mean, this is like so comical. They have the proof of God at work right before them. But they reject it. To all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further, that is, the miracle is valid, the evidence is to all people, the influence is is explosive, with thousands and thousands believing. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. They acknowledge the reality of the miracle, but they refuse to accept the truth of the Messiah. And so they become like these theological thugs, these political bullies, and they decide to say, we're just going to go back and tell these guys, stop it. Stop preaching in this name. And they can't even get themselves to say the name of Jesus. They're so filled with disdain. I mean, they were thinking that when they crucified Jesus and they did, you know, just essentially, you know, work together with the Roman authorities to, 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 muster up these false charges against Jesus and to put him on a cross and to bury him, they thought that that would be the end of their headache. But it's not. And so they said, man, we've just got to continue to stomp it in the ground. And things go from bad to worse as the disciples refuse to acquiesce to their ultimatum. Take a look at verse 18. So the leaders called them and they charged them not to speak or to teach the law at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John, I love that, but Peter and John says, no way, there's, we're not going to comply. We're not going to be bullied into silence. We're not going to be intimidated by your disregard of reality. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you, Rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them. Because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. It wasn't just Peter and John and the layman jumping for worship in God in his presence, but everyone was praising God for the miracle and for the message of Peter. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. That is, this man could testify to the reality and the truthfulness of the miracle that he had just experienced. David Peterson writes about the clash and the irony of the leadership. He says, there is a distinct irony in this section. The authorities have the power to punish the apostles. But they're afraid to use it because public opinion is against them. And Peter and John, on the other hand, they have no political power, but they demonstrate a God-given courage that is compelling in conjunction of the evidence of the healing miracle. They appear as true leaders of the people, bearing witness to what they have seen and heard despite the consequences for them personally. 
You see, Peter and John, they resist and they reject the gag order imposed on them by the, this religious council. And they dig in with their resolve to keep on speaking and teaching in the name of Jesus, bearing witness to what they have seen and heard. And it's impossible for us to do otherwise because like the apostles, when push comes to shove, it's always more important to prioritize the voice of God over the demand of others, what everyone else is telling us. And that's especially relevant for us as we strive to live out our faith and to speak out about Jesus in a cultural climate that may not tolerate and that wants to silence the message that we want to bring. Queen Aragon is a writer and a spoken word artist who is also the mom of a young child and lives in Orlando, Florida. And she recently wrote an article called The Superpower Kids and Grown-Ups Really Need. When a child dons a super, superhero costume, we see him transform into a character full of confidence and power. And our culture's love for all things superheroes gives Christians a huge opportunity to introduce kids to the ultimate superpower God wants to give them. And then she writes, this power isn't marked by political dominance, but gospel faithfulness. This power isn't expressed through superhuman strength, but supernatural love. The Holy Spirit, who indeed is God, empowers followers of Jesus to be his witnesses, people who through words and actions, embody the Messiah's kingdom of holy love all around the globe. And so before Jesus returned to, his, returned to his father's place, he prepared his followers for the hardships that they would suffer. He gave us a reality check for the opposition and the resistance that we would face to the message that we would bring to others that Jesus alone was the way to the truth the way, the truth, and the life to the Father in heaven, that he alone was the way. And so that was a major reason why he says, I don't, want you to, I don't want you to go out before the Holy Spirit comes. It would be impossible to be and do all that God designs for us apart from his Spirit. So despite encountering resistance from stubborn individuals, even like spiritual and political powers who reject the name of Jesus, the disciples exhibit a resilience with like-minded witnesses who trust the sovereignty of God. They stand up taller for the name of Jesus because they lean in closer to the presence of God, embracing the power of his spirit. Take a look at verses 23 to 28. With their daily devotion to the fellowship and to the prayers, it's not a shocker what happens here in verses 23 and following. When they were released by the chief priests, the scribes, the Sadducees, the, the leaders, they went to their friends. I love that. They went to their buddies and they reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them how they were being threatened and bullied and intimidated into silence. And we told them that no, not on, not on, not, that's not going to happen because it's impossible for us not to speak about what we have seen and heard. And when they heard it, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. As the leaders of the early church, as they gathered together with their friends, they pray to God and their minds and their hearts are directed back to the second psalm. 
where they think about the people of God and the Gentiles and how they, they gather together and they conspire against God and they plot in such a way that it's utterly useless because God is sovereign. He is the Lord over all of heaven and earth and everything in them. For truly, verse 27, in this city they were, they were gathered together Against you, your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan has predestined them to take place. That is, Paul and Peter and John and Luke, they never lose sight of the fact that God's perfect plan is accomplished through the wicked actions of people. In the midst of a real battle, when it seems like they're feeling resistance and hardship and a fulfillment of the promises that Jesus said that they would face persecution, when it's actually being materialized right before their very eyes, they refuse to quit. And they're able to stand up tall because they drop to their knees. And as they look up to the sovereign Lord over all of creation, they see the big picture. And there are moments in our lives when we think, man, it's just, I don't know what's going to happen next. And we feel the opposition and we feel the difficulty and we don't mince words. We feel like the threats are real. The insecurity that plagues our heart is a real feeling. And yet Peter and John and their friends, what they give to you and me is this glimpse of God, the sovereign Lord over all of creation. And that sometimes in the midst of our hardest battles, the very best thing we can do is to gather together with our friends and to simply lift up our voices to God in prayer. And to say, God, I know that you are there. I know that you are in charge. I know that you have given us the truth, and I know that you have provided your spirit, and I know that you could break through even the most stubborn of hearts, and that those that are fighting tooth and nail against us, that you could break through their stubbornness and actually bring them to faith in your son. Take a look at verse 29. And now, Lord, now that we've reminded ourselves of who you are, that you are the sovereign Lord over all of creation that accomplishes all of your purpose, even through evil people, we want you to look upon their threats. God, you are, tr you are just, and you are righteous, and we can trust in you. And grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, with complete courage. It's as if our hearts are like half courage. Sometimes it's scary to talk about our faith with others. And like Peter and John and their friends, they're saying, God, fill up our hearts all the way to the top with courage, with boldness, with fearless confidence. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and living in Southern California, that is a real possibility. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. I love this. Paul is saying, when we, Peter and John, not Paul, Peter and John and Luke, they're telling us in a pivotal moment that challenges the integrity and the tenacity of our faith, it's good to ask God for more boldness in our words 
as his faithful witnesses, but also to pray for more power through the name of his holy servant, Jesus. We say, God, I need more courage and more boldness and more clarity and more freedom and more confidence to speak about your son to others as your faithful witness. And God, as I deliver your message, I want you to show your power. I want you to shake things up. I want you to move in the lives of people around us so that they could have a tangible experience of your presence. And that in the same way that you restored the ability to walk in this man who had never walked a step from the moment of his birth, I want you to do things that are obviously God at work. And that when they hear our words and when they align the work that you perform, they can place their faith in Jesus as your holy servant. Because they not only hear the words, but they also see the work. And I think that's a great way for us to pray. God, give us more boldness in our words. And God, give us more power through your works. When the 71-year-old, 17-time, Grammy Award-winning English musician and actor Sting was asked about his vision for growing older, this is what he said. He said, I want to get old gracefully. I want to have good posture. I want to be healthy. And I want to be an example to my children. And I find it intriguing that when he talked about growing old gracefully, aging with grace, the first thing at the top of his list was good posture that he would stand up tall. And I thought, how is our posture as a church family? When people find out that you're a part of the Bread of Life community, and if they were to talk about what our posture is like and how we stand with Jesus, would they say that we have good posture as followers of Christ? Because growing healthy and gracefully as a faith community calls for good posture, especially when we face opposition to what we say about Jesus. And especially the truth that salvation is found exclusively in his name alone. So that rather than backing off in terror, like Peter and John, we would stand up with all courage, as we keep on proclaiming the name of Jesus. God-emboldened, spirit-shaped posture starts on our knees in Jesus' name. And that's because leaning in closer to God enables us to stand up taller for Jesus. So let's dig in our heels because the opposition is real. The attacks, they don't feel nice. But you know, in the midst of that, we can say, God, give us more boldness in our words and show us more power through your works. Let's pray together. As the Holy Spirit opens our minds and speaks to our hearts. You might be thinking, I've been around the block, but actually haven't stopped and said, I believe in Jesus. That there is only the name of Jesus by which I must be saved. And I want you at this moment to say, Jesus, Jesus, thank you for dying upon the cross for my sins. 
thank you that you have not only been raised from the dead, but you are also enthroned at the Father's right hand. And so I look to you to save me for my sins. And I want to follow you all the days of my life so that I could be faithful to the very end. And I want you to think about maybe that classmate, that relative, that colleague that sometimes could get on our nerves because of the hostility that they have toward the name of Jesus. But God wants to use you as his faithful witness. And so pray for more boldness, that God would give you all courage coupled with his power and that you could see an even greater miracle than the lame being raised. Father, we thank you for the beautiful, the wonderful, the powerful, the awesome name of Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen.